Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. From a purely materialistic point of view, the house is an important but rather mundane part of human life, providing shelter and privacy. Leaving your analysis here would, however, leave you with a woefully incomplete understanding. Houses are status symbols, sanctuaries, and sometimes vessels of the dead, the morbid phenomenon we call a haunted house. The traditional understanding of a haunted house is of a restless spirit motivating paranormal phenomenon within a home's walls. A less common, however, just as morbid explanation requires no such spectral inhabitants. That a house can simply be rotten or malignant. That one can look into the darkened windows of a dusty old homestead and feel the house looking back, the darkness of an open door ready to swallow you whole. One of the things I've noticed as of late is certain circles of the online horror community voicing their feelings that horror games and web series are getting stale, that things are becoming uninspired, samey. And I've voiced some of my thoughts about that on this channel over the past few videos, and I hope I've been able to introduce people to some interesting and impactful projects over these past few months. And I suppose that quest continues today. While I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with a lot of the current indie horror trends, they are just that trends, and with that comes saturation. And if you're looking for something outside of the spooky faces, monsters, and jump scares, it can take a bit of legwork to find a style or execution of horror that is wholly different. And I think that's what Kitty Horror Show provides. Kitty Horror Show is an indie dev who has been around making games for at least a decade now. She garnered a niche followership drawn to her explorative lo-fi experiences filled with incredibly vivid writing and unique sensibilities. Games filled with allusions to ancient beings and civilizations and morbid fascinations with all things bloody, goopy, infested, pulsing, or chittering. Insects, parasites, masses of flesh. But her style is unique not just in what it includes, but notably what you won't find in a typical Kitty Horror Show game. Jump scares, chase sequences, monsters are all sparse if they exist at all. Conventions of horror that span from Resident Evil to Slender the Eight Pages to Five Nights at Freddy's aren't typically found within the morbid worlds you can find on her itch.io page. Kitty Horror Show is a master at creating stripped down yet incredibly rich atmospheric experiences, from the sound design to the visuals to the writing. Statistically speaking, if you've seen Kitty Horror Show's work, it was probably the game Anatomy, which briefly broke out into the more mainstream indie horror scene. But I want to give her projects a bit more time to shine, in what little way I can. So I've played through all of the games on her itch.io page, and I want to talk about them. First, I'll go through each of them individually, but in the second part of this video, I want to touch on and investigate one aspect that I think permeates most of her work. You could write entire essays about her use of parasites and insects and religious symbolism and all manner of other recurring themes throughout her work, but one piece that stuck out to me is her use of places. From deserts to houses to the moon, much of her work is intently focused on the places we inhabit, and it's where much of the horror comes from as well. So that is what I'll be focusing on in my deeper analysis later on. I really like these games, and I just want to say at the outset, if any of these games sound interesting to you, you should head over to Kitty Horror Show's itch.io page and play them for yourself. They're all fairly short, and with the exception of Anatomy, they are set at name your price, so there's really no reason not to. But for now, let's take a walk through the haunted worlds of Kitty Horror Show. So I won't be going through these games entirely chronologically. For instance, the Haunted Cities collections, which are the most recent games on her itch.io, contain games that were once only available on her Patreon dating back to 2015. Similarly, while the rest of the games seem to be vaguely chronological, some differ in their listing positions from their release date. For the purposes of this video, we're just going to be going from the bottom up, and that means we'll be beginning our journey with Here is Where I Carve My Heart. Unfortunately, I was unable to play this game for myself. As far as I could find, it's only available using the Unity web player, which doesn't really work anymore. However, someone thankfully had the foresight to record a full playthrough of it and upload it to YouTube. 
Brian Lex Brian, as they detail in the description of their upload, decided to record this in hopes of preserving it as Unity web player's discontinuation make it more difficult to play. So the footage you'll be seeing is from Brian Lex Brian, and I will be giving my commentary on the game as it is played here. Like most of Kitty Horror Show's projects, opening the game boots you directly into the world, no menu or title screen. You find yourself in a deeply purple void, surrounded by dark clouds standing on a massive metallic pyramid. The sound of a soft music box plays alongside a ghostly synth, all under the calming sound of the wind. The sound design walks a delicate line between tranquil melancholy and, in the empty darkness of the world, a hint of eerie. Unlike most of the games we'll be covering here, Here's Where I Carve My Heart is not a horror game. In fact, its motivations almost seem to be the exact opposite. Instead of instilling fear and uncertainty, this game wants to inspire comfort and serenity. The mechanics are simple, and will soon become familiar as we explore more of these games. Wandering this floating structure and navigating its simple platforming, you come across and collect these glowing gemstones. After each one is collected, an intricate font reveals itself across the screen, spelling out a piece of a poem. As far as I can tell, each sentence is connected to a specific gem, so depending on what order you find them in, this poem might come together differently, giving a unique voice and emphasis to each line. I've connected the lines and put them together in a way that seems to flow best to me, but again, I really do think it is a personal experience. We are all so many sparks, flying from an endless pyre. The flames that flay us become the lessons that teach us. Let your blood become light, and you will outshine the stars. Your skin is not flesh, it is light, splendid, and heavenly. Love is a song, and you are a crucial instrument. You are a single voice, you are the choir. Let music be the hand that pets your hair as you drift to sleep. Many will tell you that you have value, and all of them are right. You would not exist were you not meant to do so. Your feathers are priceless, beloved little bird. Bring your shoulder blades together and feel your wings. Remind the skin of your back of the feel of the grass. It gets better. The penultimate line is found at the top of the pyramid, where a slowly pirouetting diamond floats above you. Here is where I carve my heart. There appears to be no traditional end to the game. You just close out of it once you feel you've explored its contents or gotten your fill of relaxing reassurance. You can fall off the pyramid into the void, but you will find yourself teleported right back to the featureless yet welcoming structure. The description of the itch page reads, a solitary pyramid that exists to remind you that you are wondrous. This character of the pyramid, and to an extent the game itself, feels, well, warm may not be the right word for it, as the sound and visual seem to imply a chill in the air and a metallic cool to the touch, but reassuring and almost paternalistic, inviting and comforting, but maybe a little intimidating. Going off of Kitty Horror Show's other games and the general description of a massive featureless structure in a dark void, it would be understandable to get the impression that exploring this game would feel a bit uneasy. But here, the featurelessness of the pyramid and the void feel like the opposite. This place exists without the pressures or viewers of the outside world. You exist here without a body, a place outside of time and space, a location that grants you the ability to simply be and that be enough. Despite its less than horrific contents, this game actually shares a lot with the games going forward, from its explorative, atmospheric nature to the mechanics of platforming and collecting bits of writing. So while things are starting a bit calm, they're definitely important to getting a whole picture of these projects. Our next game, similar to this one, isn't entirely spooky, but after that, things pick up quite a bit. So if you'll grant me the patience, let's move on to Sigil Valley. The description on the itch page is pretty straightforward. This game has no ending. Explore a tranquil moonscape, touch sculptures, learn their glyphic language, and hear their songs. And just as it says on the tin, the game boots you into a dark, low-poly lunar valley, surrounded by columns and remnants of some long-past civilization. The world is mostly painted in gray hues, but these massive, purple, shining statues shoot from the ground, some atop these structures. They take the form of animals, mushrooms, and even humans. A calming ambient track plays in the background as you explore simple platforming, this time with moon gravity, to reach each of these towering sculptures. Something about the game compels you to keep exploring, the splashes of platforming giving a sort of natural progression to your journey to reach each statue. It actually took me a moment to realize that you can even interact with them, which causes a unique glyph to appear for each one, along with their respective sound. Sounds of nature, birdsong, or music. 
The environment compels the imagination to wonder what this civilization was like. What do these sigils mean? What did this place used to be? It packs a punch for its small scale. And we can start to see Kitty Horror Show's inclination, focus, and skills at creating places. It really is compelling how she's able to create this environment filled with the remnants of ancient civilizations. It's strangely beautiful and sad, and creates a real sense of wonder despite its low poly nature. So far, aside from their darkness, equal parts calming, mysterious, and melancholy, things haven't felt too scary as of yet. But things are going to get a little more unnerving with the next game, Sunset Spirit Steel. Sunset Spirit Steel combines elements of both previous games, exploring the remnants of a desolate, long-since-abandoned civilization and the collecting of items that give you pieces of text. In this case, though, things are more morbid. The world is a dark contrast of reds, pinks, and purples, perpetually in a state of twilight. The environment has more texture, though they're low res and everything is still polygonal, evoking the PlayStation 1 era. It creates a strikingly hostile-looking environment, everything looking like it could impale you. Abandoned structures jut through the horizon, rusted and dirt-covered towers and creaking windmills. An eerie wind plays as you explore, finding strange shards. With the collection of each one, text appears on screen, telling the story of the eventual fall of this community, fragments of conversations and the thoughts of the people who lived there. Piecing it together, it seems that in an attempt to raise the status of the village, the townspeople begin collecting something, though it's not immediately clear. Eventually, you do find what the text is referring to. Strange statues or artifacts, all warped in root-like shapes, each spinning slightly when you approach and emitting eerie sounds, from unnatural drones to the sounds of crying. The text paints a picture of these artifacts having some malevolent nature, growing in power as more of them are brought together, and as this malignant power grew, it led to an unspecified downfall of the community. You collect the last piece of the story, and the world turns dark. The horror of the previously innocuous seeming mechanics of the last two games is starting to reveal itself as both an incredibly engaging and even unnerving format for a game experience. While the previous two games did have hints and themes of ancient places and explorative elements, here we're seeing a more explicit focus and importance on the history of environments. The experience of learning what happened to the desolate township is both gripping and eerie. This place remains as a memory, the hostile and eerie world a reflection of the hostile end of the people that were here. At the same time though, we don't learn too much. Just as we're beginning to understand the danger of these strange artifacts around us, it cuts us off, leaving us with an incomplete story, a mystery we may never solve. Actius, named after the Asian American moon moths, certainly looks more refined at a first glance, but at its core it's a very similar game. A dark landscape highlighted with glowing greens left for who knows how long, remnants of structures long since abandoned. The game boots with a screen that reads Restore Me before placing you in the world. I suppose that's our goal. Exploring this place, you'll find these small altars, and interacting with them places a gemstone, and reveals massive glowing text in the sky that, like Sunset Spirit Steel before it, reveals the story of the downfall of this place. Though this time, it's not from the perspective of the townspeople. The story it reveals seems to imply some old god or personification of the earth is speaking, as its body or power are used to build a city, with striking prose like, sculpture is the art of torturing stone. There's clear pain behind every line. This ancient being exploited to power a paradise for those who took her apart. As you continue interacting with these altars, aside from just the text, more of the world begins revealing itself massive spinning towers, and the shape of a woman, two wings sprouting from her shoulders. It seems that, at some point, this paradise crumbled and left nothing but a goddess ripped apart. When you finish restoring this being, there's an eerie but perhaps uplifting final message. Thank you. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a crossroads to sunder. It seems that she will be able to gain some retribution, or at least return things to how they should be. While it is less horror-focused than the last, we still get a dark, ambient, atmospheric exploration with a focus on uncovering the story through exploring the place. The story calls obvious parallels to the exploitation of the Earth's resources, and much like Here is Where I Carve My Heart, personifies the world through this deity. But I think the feelings of pain expressed in the prose is far more universal, the anguish and despair of being used and taken advantage of. But it ends on the feelings of righteous anger but also freedom that comes from a chance at empowerment. 
This one's vibe is a bit different, and I probably won't spend too much time on this one because its themes don't quite mesh as well as the other games in Kitty Horror Show's library. Also, it's more of an interactive text story, and it is quite short, so I'd sort of be taking the fun out of the experience by just summarizing. I'll give you the hook though, and if it seems like your thing, I definitely suggest going to check it out. Wolf Girls in Love is a fast-paced, interactive horror romance short story. The writing is quick, vivid, and intimate. My first thought after reading it was how much it reminded me of Clipping, one of my favorite bands. Both are able to create incredibly vivid imagery and sensation with powerful and precise writing. It showcases more of Kitty Horror Show's excellent writing prowess, especially with just snippets of sentences. It gives us more of the horror themes we'll be seeing, introduces us to the format of interactive text-based stories, which we'll see more of in the future, and that splash of romance won't be gone forever, though we'll get to that when we get there. Rain, House, Eternity. The scale of this game expands a bit. We find ourselves in a monochrome world, rain pouring overhead, the occasional tree as our guide giving us some sense of direction. Eventually, we stumble upon a massive building, perhaps a temple of some kind. Pink gemstones can be found lying about, revealing messages from someone unknown. I was thrown upon this altar against my will. In the center of this building, an elevator takes us up into the fog above us. Another message, this time appearing directly on our screen. I was brought here, just as you but I was brought here long ago, and so you will hear my story just as yours unfolds. Take no comfort. There is pain in your immediate future. With that ominous message, we begin our journey, going higher and higher through floating cities, threatening spikes, and peaceful islands with colorful trees. The messages from this person unfold and tell us their story, always alluding to its similarity with ours. This person reveals that their community, the ones they trusted, seemingly sacrificed them. Their life had been planned for them. My course was set for me. What heresy was committed by my birth? I was never given a chance. The ones they thought would protect them being the hands of their own destruction. This character's lack of choice is very much at the forefront. The expectations their community had for them thrusted upon them, and when they didn't meet it, the love they thought was there revealed itself to be false. As you continue through the stark environment, we begin to learn that this person became the very floor we walk on. The stone you ascend was once my skin, my spine. Every shape you have traversed I have chosen for myself. My rebirth has made me undefinable and infinite. I shed the pretense of form and became perfect. I am at once the queen and the kingdom. They've broken through the constraints of physical form, and this transformation isn't entirely surprising. Previous lines about being envious of the cicada as it sheds its skin suggest that transformation is a major theme as well. As you near the end, you find the very sacrificial altar alluded to at the beginning of the game, appearing with obvious implication. You are at the end of this knife now, but the voice gives you a choice. You can meet your end at this altar, embrace the void, or you can join the voice in rejecting physical form, transforming forever from the only shape you've known. If you choose the altar, the voice laments your passing but does not blame you, hoping the void will provide peace the world did not give you. The game closes. If you choose the door and join the voice, after a brief ending cutscene, you could reboot the game and find what could be the monument you became, like the voice before you. Or perhaps it's what's left after the spirit of the last person is gone. Either ending is a sobering culmination of the deeply personal story we've been reading this whole time. Just by ending it on that choice, even if you choose to join the voice in rejecting the physical limits, there is always the implication that others will follow, like you followed the voice, in the same predicament they found themselves in, and you found yourself in, and their choice may not be the same. I want to preface here before I get too deep into my analysis that all of my discussion of these games I'll be doing has been filtered through my interpretation. This is true of this game, all the games before, and all the games going forward. I wanted to preface that here because I don't want you to take my word as the definitive understanding of these games, and also because these games are so purposefully crafted to be open to the player's experiences and to allow individual players to take something different out of it. Like I said near the start of this video, I highly recommend if any of these games sound interesting to you to give them a shot. With that said, now the themes here of identity and agency and the ability to make your own choices both mentally and physically along with the themes of transformation, lends this story to being a pretty fantastic reflection on gender identity and the experiences of people who are trans, non-binary, and those who don't fit into gender norms, and the effects of non-acceptance and intolerance. It's a deeply empathetic game, and even if you don't identify directly with parts of it, it's definitely worth playing, not just for the incredible execution and the chance to understand the experiences of others, but also because I think the themes of agency and expectations are deeply universal, if not all in the same way or to the 
same extent. It's also worth noting that this game continues the trend of personifying places, this time very directly. The messages you're receiving are coming from someone who was once like you, but has now taken the form of a massive structure. The floors, the walls, all created from the anatomy of what once was a person, reflecting themselves and the choices they made, the agency they claimed when they built their new form. And this reflection of emotions and experiences in the environment already has been and will continue to be a greatly recurring theme from here on. Outside of the story itself, one interesting thing this game introduces is the element of reopening the game after it's been closed to find something more. This concept will be used in future games, and it's good to make note of it here because it's going to be pretty important in some future experiences. So we've had some brushes with the eerie and uncanny so far, but here is where we delve directly into utter fear and terror. Welcome to 0000 FF0000. The experience for this game begins on the download page, where instead of finding a descriptive blurb about the game, it's just this scattered, nonsensical text along with a single distorted screenshot repeated with varying levels of corruption. Downloading the file, you'll find a sort of maze of similarly nonsensically named folders, maneuvering your way through seemingly random strings of text trying to find an executable file. In that way, the first place we explore in this game is our own computer's files. It almost gives the impression that the game doesn't want to be found. When you do finally track down the file, there's a bit of work to find out how to run it. It's so deep in this mess of folders, you may have to pull it and its data files out of the cavernous pit of folders you found it in. Once there, the typical Unity launch options aren't much more descriptive. This buildup has you wondering what the contents of this game could possibly be, and if it's trying so hard to remain hidden, do you even want to see what it has in store? But your curiosity has led you this far. You hit launch, and... You're immediately thrown into a horrific, clipping, distorted soundscape in an equally corrupted world. A maze of grungy stone textures, static covering the screen. And just a few moments in, seemingly the game itself confirms our initial musings about it not wanting to be found. I don't want you here. Kicked back into the game, a horrific siren begins, as a mass of red flesh and light begins expanding toward you. Run all you want through the darkened maze, there is no way out. More text, this time too distorted for me to make out, but let me know if you can figure out what it says. And you're transported to eerie silence, except for the sound of slowed weeping. You're on a plane, seemingly random textures plastered all around you, spikes shooting from the ground, and a massive wailing statue with a beak-like face in the center. I realized accidentally while trying to jump, that pressing the spacebar now shoots some sort of sharp projectile, which causes the figure to cry out when hit. Doing so enough times takes you to a new area, now in a dark void surrounded by water and a maze-like set of walkways. The imagery almost immediately reminded me of the docks in Yumeniki, or perhaps more fittingly, hell. The textures on the ground glitch and flicker, and as you wander in a panic from the hostile soundscape that's reminiscent of compressed screams looking for any exit or escape, more glitched text appears, unable to even form words. Flickering, vein-like shapes appear as the audio continues to deteriorate. It's like we're seeing the very fabric of this game break down. More text, again hard to read, but I can make out the tide, the sea, the crook of her arm. Then the word cages over and over, and the void around you is surrounded by dark red patterns almost like the flesh we saw in the beginning, complete with the overwhelming red light. Wanted. Waves. Suddenly, figures emerge from the water, and just as you process this in sheer panic, God, 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 God. surrounded by these ominous figures, unsure of what will happen next, the game crashes. The near illegible text we get throughout the game are the only real hint of story. The waves, the cages, we can maybe begin to link these with things we see in the environments, the water surrounding us, the weeping silhouette, but in the end, the story is scattered chaos, shards of a picture that we'll never see come together, a story that we'll never truly know because it doesn't want to be known. And that's the most compelling thing about this game. It's like the files, the data, the ones and zeros are alive, but not just alive, in pain. It's hidden itself away hoping to be undisturbed, but you have discovered it. And simply by being there, bringing it into existence, it's painful. It distorts and deteriorates until finally it closes itself, ending its suffering. We've talked a bit so far about Kitty Horror Show's penchant for taking the landscape and places we find ourselves in and personifying them. The pyramid, the ancient goddess of Actius, 
the architecture in Rain House Eternity. In this case though, it isn't just the hills or staircases we see in the game. The game itself is the place. The space it takes up on our hard drive, the programming of the game is alive, aware, and most horrifically in agony. The concept of the game being alive and breaking before your eyes is something not a lot of games can capture. Sometimes the meta aspects of a game can't break through to the viewer very well because they're polished. They look like the developer put them there. But games with the right level of jank, the lack of polish, make it feel more believable. As weird a comparison as it may be, and you've heard me bring this up before, but the original Five Nights at Treasure Island is first where I felt this feeling. The game was so janky, and the little touches like the game jump scaring you if the menu was left on for too long, or the horribly mixed, loud and compressed ass sound effects. Games that embrace jank in their horror make it feel like you're actually playing something haunted, like the game itself is going to jump out get you. It's one of the reasons I think the lo-fi VHS and PSX style has taken over the genre as of late, and I feel like 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 FF0000 000 000 000 000 takes that to the extreme and creates a really unique and terrifying experience. Hornets. Here, we're taking a step back from the 3D Unity games and into the text-based interactive format, similar to Wolf Girls in Love. However, despite its gameplay similarity to the latter, in all other ways it resembles the other stories we've played through so far, for reasons not the least of which being that it's far more interactive and explorative, allowing you to choose many different paths to explore the world, with much longer and more descriptive passages of text conjuring vivid visual sensations. While I will go a bit more into detail here, just like with Wolf Girls in Love, simply describing or reading back large portions of exact passages from the text sort of takes the fun out of playing it yourself, so I'll be somewhat brief. It starts with a pretty bold first sentence. It's your fault the world is ending. And so, the story slowly reveals itself through the eyes of our protagonist. A citizen of a now decimated city, the massive walls that protected it, no use against the massive swarm of giant hornets that now ravage its streets, blindly eviscerating any living thing except you. As we explore the city's wrecked shopping district, temples, and gardens, we begin to learn a bit more about this society and our place in it. We were one of the few who possessed the ability to utilize the power of the gods and goddesses of this world, painting glyphs that can harness the influence of these deities, and for reasons we do not ever find out that our character even seems unsure of. One day we summon the powers of hate, goddess of plague, stinging insects, mother of the hive, painting the glyphs for death, swarm, end, wings, night. A survivor we find asks us why we did it, to which we are given a handful of choices to answer, but none are very illuminating. And don't change the outcome. The world is ending. The survivor is promptly split in half by the mandibles of a massive hornet. Exploring the remains of this city all the while, we are slowly collecting items we find along the way, just like our previous games. Once we've collected them all, we're able to head to the gates outside the city. In a stunned sort of haze at the destruction they've caused, our protagonist wanders out of the city through the hills and woods to the towers where the swarm comes from, a place of the gods. Using the items you've collected, you attempt to set fire to the whole place, but the gods' powers cannot be used against them, so you only succeed in burning yourself alive as the swarm continues to ravage the earth. This story continues to show Kitty Horror Show's incredible writing skills and ability to paint a vivid mental picture, and continues to present these recurring themes we've been discussing. Instead of seeing a civilization many years after its downfall, we're thrown right into the direct aftermath. It feels like a natural extension of these continuing elements. The gods' powers and the swarms of hornets representative of these forces of nature, extensions of the environment, similar to the goddess of Actius or the strange artifacts of sunset spirit steel. It's also wonderfully gory and morbid, and it begins to showcase one of Kitty Horror Show's other interests that will continue to show up throughout her work, insects, parasites, and body horror. And these parasites themes, along with the dangerous forces of nature, will continue into our next game, Kryza. While previous games so far have shown us peeks into the stories their worlds hold, most explicitly with Rain House Eternity, most of them have been suggestions of a plot. And that's great, that's what they're going for. But with Kryza, we're going to start seeing more explicit storytelling, in a way that begins to prepare us for larger works like Anatomy. Kryza plays out similarly to previous projects, placing you in the hostile, disconcerting remnants of some community, this time in the middle of a small village surrounded by desert bathed in a deeply yellow light. On all 
all sides of this desert surrounding the unassuming village are massive black monoliths, chief of which is an ominous looking pyramid. Visiting each of these formations, we can once again find gems. Instead of giving us text, however, we're treated to grainy audio recordings of the last survivor of the center village. Each location has a unique challenge, whether that be brief platforming, ascending a floating elevator, or taking leaps of faith across invisible walkways. The story we hear from this grainy voice does not paint a particularly pleasant picture of these structures. One day, the pyramid arose from the sand, inexplicably producing heat all on its own. The village flocked to it, feeling it was a place of comfort and warmth. Some of the villagers began to joke that the pyramid had become a second mother. However, this comfort came at a cost. A stinging in their eyes, their skin begins to blister, and slowly, the villagers disappear, their state worsening, their skin peeling, their vision failing, and then in the morning, nothing left of them but footprints in the sand leading to the sealed door of the pyramid. More of these monuments begin to sprout up each morning. Our narrator's mother is one of the last to go, but before she does, the narrator asks her a question. I asked her what the word oblation meant. The mother is off-put by this, and she never gives an answer. The character explains that one morning it simply appeared in their head, like a message from the pyramid. For those wondering, it means to give a religious offering. Well, it appears these people are the offerings. Our story begins to close with the voice knowing that it is their turn to go to the pyramid and discussing their fears. And while the others had found comfort in the new structures of shade and warmth, our narrator had always felt a bit off-put by the whole thing. Day turns to night, the time when the villagers would disappear, and as we may have suspected, the pyramid door is open. Inside, a red shape floats in the center, emanating a deep and terrifying scream. The end. This game, not only being a fantastically macabre and gripping tale, continues to show Kitty Horror Show's proclivity to the parasitic relationship, as the village feeds off of these mysterious structures' warmth even as it is slowly killing them. Again though, we also see the themes of these larger, ancient forces of nature and their deeply dangerous elements. And the way they're described as sending messages to the villagers acting as their second mother, we see them characterized as if they're alive with motives, and if they're not malicious, then at the very least their intentions make no difference in their effects to us humans. It's also very clearly evoking both the ancient pyramids and some of the stories and myths surrounding them, but also nuclear disaster and waste disposal. With these massive black monoliths and the descriptions of heat radiating from them causing the skin to blister and eyes to sting, I couldn't help but be reminded of the concept drawings of nuclear waste sites trying to communicate their danger to future civilizations with these massive black spires. And the red eye at the end, in the center of the pyramid, screaming. It evokes the elephant's foot in the Chernobyl plant, a mass of melted nuclear material underneath the plant. Nuclear power serves as a perfect analog to unexplainable, dangerous seemingly supernatural elements of our world, an invisible, undetectable without specific technology force that slowly destroys us. While, again, I can't say for sure what the authorial intent of these stories are, as a surface reading, this feels almost like a cautionary tale, the dangers of trying to utilize forces of nature that we don't fully understand. In another way, though, that relationship between the pyramid and the village is indicative of other themes we've seen in these games so far. Betrayal from that and those which give you comfort and that you trust, toxic and harmful relationships which give a false sense of security as you're slowly whittled away, and the dangers of blindly following a community as it's fed on pernicious sources. I think that's one of the great things about Kitty Horror Show's works, is that they can be read in so many ways. It's also worth noting the message that the game comes with, warning us not to play it if this appeared on our computer without our knowledge. If you downloaded it on purpose, cool. If it mysteriously arrived one day, you have to complete a sort of curse-breaking ritual, including glyphs and detailed instructions. I'm noting a recurring use of glyphs in these games. This warning does oddly remind me of nuclear power, like if it shows up unannounced, it's probably bad news. Dust City. This is Kitty Horror Show's self-described first complete 3D game. It may actually be one of the older ones we've covered so far, and has a good amount of meat on its bones. It even comes with a bit of homework to start with, a series of password-locked zip files and a quick start guide. The guide explains the premise. You are a paranormal researcher, and using your handy handheld Esotech Arcano Dex, which allows you to interact with and translate metaphysical phenomenon in writings, you'll be exploring and doing research. This includes being able to move through doors, which may be liable to transport Support you to completely new areas. With that quick guide out of the way, let's get exploring. Booting in, you find yourself in an empty city surrounded by a yellow haze, the so-called dust, it seems. Within this desolate metropolis, you discover a strange floating anomaly, what looks like an eye surrounded by shifting glyphs. Utilizing your arcano decks, you can decode its message. All the metal in the world was howling at once, like the cries of a wounded titan. An ominous start, but from here, 
as if from thin air, you discover a door, which leads us to our first new area. A dark gray world filled with floating and shifting geometry, the impression of a city or complex but no detail to be found. Wandering through the walkways and platforms, we find more of these floating anomalies, each giving us new fragments of thoughts or phrases reflecting some sort of world-ending event that occurred some time ago. Even the roads seemed to hold their breath as the sky came ever closer. Our glass towers and gold lights were not enough to protect us. For a single moment, before we were nothing, we were equal. Continuing your exploration, you'll find a strange artifact which, when examined with your Arcanodex, gives you a code. A code to one of the locked zip files but we'll return to that later. The next world I explored was a void of technicolor textures, moonlight gravity, and floating crystalline and obsidian platforms with a floating temple-like structure in the center. More of these anomalies continue to expand on this end of the world. We had built so many sanctuaries, some of light, others of stone. The stars ground them all to sand, a rainstorm of glass in a volley of steel. The air shimmered for whole hours. It reads almost like the sun consuming the earth or some kind of heat death scenario. We even get what seems to be a snippet of conversation in the days leading up to the end. Shit, the internet's out. Again. Say it's happening everywhere. This connection to the internet continues with another anomaly stating, We put all our knowledge into silicon and glass, which turns to ash just as quickly as flesh and bone. Gathering our artifact and code at the temple, we move on to our next world. We find ourselves on a floating island, surrounded by Greek columns and leafless trees. Also coins! Yippee! The anomalies continue to poetically spell out the destruction of their world. There was grass once, and tall trees, and water. The deluge chewed through it all and made it dust. The sun had never been so red, at once beautiful and terrible. She was weeping as the lake evaporated, the soil burned became desert. Despite our current world's appearance of tranquility and beauty, the descriptions paint a much bleaker picture of what once occurred. Finding our artifact, we move on to the next. By far the grimmest location so far, standing on a pitch black walkway only filled with the sounds and sights of massive spinning rusty blades. An anomaly pleads with us, please don't leave me here with him. We soon find out who he is. This horrible shape, almost resembling a face, lies at the end of the catwalk along with the artifact. Let's get the hell out of here. Our final area begins in a dimly red-lit house. An anomaly tells us, can I have a single fucking moment of privacy in this house? All right, clearly we're not welcome here. Exiting, we find ourselves in a grungy outdoor environment, the sky lit up in red, painting dark silhouettes of the mountains that surround us. Wooden walkways connect islands surrounded by a lake of blood. Some buildings seem to resemble medieval castles. Another anomaly greets us with a friendly, I hate you. Up a brief bit of platforming, we find our artifact. Exploring further still, up a winding ramp, we find ourselves in another house. The Arcano Dex gives us a single ominous message as we enter run. In the attic, a chair sits overlooking a window and a single floating object awaits. We approach and are greeted with a scream along with the message. False gods, false blood, false teeth, false skin, false love, false hope, false eyes, false nostrils, false hate, false soil, false pride, false sky. The object disappears, leaving us in a panicked state, wondering what our next step is. But after catching our breath, it seems clear. We have all the artifacts, all the codes. We can finally open up all the zip files. What lies inside? Our first zip, titled Agares, holds a folder titled Our Vacation. Inside, we find a set of photos, all taken at night. They're eerie, grainy, and showcase the exterior of homes, buildings, and radio towers. Unsettling to view, but so far mostly ambiguous. Inside of a zip titled Boer, we find a twine game titled House Nightmare. At the outset of the game, we are able to choose various items and then proceed down various paths, our items leading to different outcomes depending on our paths. I won't get into every possible path or ending, but some examples include bringing a bird deity back to its bird people in a cave, and very notably, a red bathed house, wandering up the stairs and eventually being consumed into the walls, flesh and plaster melded until you are one. Inside Marax, we find a series of transmissions, audio files that include compressed sounds of destruction. They sound as if they are taken directly from the world-ending event that has been described throughout Dust City. The sounds of chaos of a world being evaporated, ground into sand before the silence of nothingness. Similar audio can be found within a zip file marked Citri. Inside our final zip folder, Salos, we find a series of text documents whose contents are headache-inducingly difficult to decipher. Every word is off by at least a few letters into this soup of barely readable stories. I'm gonna own up here, I've not been able to fully trans 
translate most of these, it makes my brain hurt. I think I've got most of it, but if anyone in the comments wants to take a crack at them, be my guest. But for now, I'll summarize what I've been able to glean from them. One details a woman reminiscing about her childhood home and how much she misses it. Another vividly paints a picture of a woman as she readies herself for sleep, hoping for a dream to envelop her. And another still describes a man clinging to his dream world. Dust City is definitely the game so far with the most meat on its bones, and I think its vivid writing describing an awe-inspiringly massive end to the world from the ghostly perspective of its previous inhabitants, along with its slow burn into the genuine horror and its various hidden pieces locked behind the passcodes we slowly gain access to throughout the game, makes this one stand out among the rest. But in the end, we're still finding these connections to the same themes. Exploration, the forces of nature overtaking our civilizations, in this case in one fell swoop. Its discussion of humanity and in the end Earth's ultimate mortality is provocative and gripping, but it also manages to touch on so many other things through that. Our need to preserve our knowledge and by extension ourselves, hoping that storing our lives and our history on computers and servers and the internet will secure us, digitally embalming ourselves in an attempt at immortality. But in the end, all our knowledge, every one and everything that has ever been known, is just as finite as our own lives, and will eventually turn to ash all the same. The monuments and sanctuaries sanctuaries and cities we build all return to dust. But there's something else in Dust City that keeps coming up. This imagery of the red bathed house. In the final area, we find two eerie homesteads, their respective peaks of the horror, and we find chilling photos of houses at night, reminisce on childhood homes, and in the aptly named house nightmare, we end up horrifically consumed by a house. It all feels slightly disconnected from the other aspects of Dust City, like it should be leading to something else. And it did. So, we have finally arrived at Anatomy, which is probably Kitty Horror Show's most popular project. And in many ways, it feels like a culmination of so much of her previous work. On its surface, the game does function like many of the previous games we've covered so far. You find yourself inside an abandoned home. There's nothing particularly abnormal about it at first glance, aside maybe from the unsettlingly thick darkness. It could pass for an average suburban home. On the kitchen table, a tape player sits. In the psychology of the modern, civilized human being, it is difficult to overstate the significance of the house. Since as early as the Neolithic era, humankind has defined itself by its buildings. But of all the structures that mankind has invented for itself, there is little doubt that the house is that which it relies upon most completely for its continued survival. And so here's our familiar, collection-based gameplay loop. Finding tapes around the house, returning to the kitchen to play them, listening to part of a sort of monologue deconstructing the anatomy of a house and comparing each room as it relates to human anatomy, and usually going to find the next tape in the room that has just been mentioned. Finding yourself in the abandoned remains of a lived-in space and collecting items that fill you in on the place you currently reside is very much the Kitty Horror Show MO, so this fits right in despite its more claustrophobic atmosphere. Visually, the game refines the low-poly aesthetics with a vaguely retro look and an unsettling VHS filter. The house is adorned with drawings of bugs, ticks, human anatomy, and houses, and the house has just the right amount of detail to feel lived in, but not for a very long time. Whoever had spent their time here has not been back for many years. The tapes, from their lo-fi quality to the contents of the writing to the delivery of each line, do a perfect job of building dread and suspense with every passing moment. Each piece is written in an almost academic fashion, like listening to a doctoral thesis from a university concerned entirely with the morbid and strange. Each one expands more on this concept of a house as a living entity and how its various organs and structures function compared to ours stairwells as the spine, the living room as the heart, the windows as the eyes. For example, let us examine the living room. Often the dominant space of a house is ground level, as well as typically the center of activity in a well-populated home. The living room is very much the heart of the house. The living room circulates people, activity, communication. It is the room most likely to be found beating, as active and vivacious as its name would imply. The comparison is only strengthened when we consider also that the living room is most commonly the room to contain the fireplace, making it additionally a locus of actual physical heat. The hallways and corridors of the house are its veins, providing circulation coursing throughout its frame. A staircase bears more than a passing resemblance, both physically and symbolically, to a spine. The windows of a house serve much the same purpose as eyes, and anyone who has ever rounded a bend or a long drive and come suddenly face to face with a tall, dark manor 
will tell you that it is difficult to shake the impression that the house, through its lightless windows, is a creature capable of vision and intelligence. In perhaps the game's most genius move, it builds up the basement as the darkest and eeriest part of the home's design, and then immediately asks you to descend inside. The basement is dark. It is buried. It is a place full of cobwebs where memories are stored. A poignant comparison, truly. Often the unnerving uncertainty that comes with considering the deeper aspects of the human psyche is not unlike gazing down at the swimming blackness pooled at the bottom of a basement stairwell. It is a place we spend our childhoods filling with monsters that will lay for years in patient silence. It is a place that, barring some specific errand, we seldom ever want to go. However, like most of her games so far, there is no monster or killer there to get you. The dread simply builds, and once you've gone through and listened to all the tapes, the game closes. And you could leave that there. But we've played Rain House Eternity. We know there's always the possibility of something more hiding on the other side. Reopening the game leads you to a slightly different version of the game. It's not immediately clear at first, but the house is just a little off. While you continue collecting the tapes just like you did last time, you'll start to notice subtle differences. For one, the sound quality of the tapes is degraded further, and suddenly windows have appeared in the house, previously described by the game as the eyes of the house. The walls are now watching us. Textures glitch, items out of place, geometry completely broken, and as you continue, it only gets worse. Spider-like tendrils reminiscent of 0000FF000. The house is breaking down. Also, you can find this horrific tape player. Messages like, it hurts, and you never came back appear on the VHS as you play, nearing the end. As you're trapped in the decaying basement, the voice on the tape begins talking about how humans are essentially parasites on homes. Slowly, teeth grow from the floor and ceiling. The tape ends on the floor, with the voice describing a house that was left abandoned for years, lonely and empty, becoming resentful and angry. I've heard there are multiple endings you can get, but this was mine, and I encourage you to play the game for yourself, to get what may end up being a unique experience for your ending. In the world of indie horror, this game is really something special. Its lack of monsters and clear conventions of the genre while still being able to build dread and fear in a masterful way definitely makes it a standout experience, but it doesn't shy away from its inspirations. The readme for the game dedicates the game directly to the influential horror author Shirley Jackson. The writing on display in Anatomy is very reminiscent of Jackson's work, like Haunting of Hill House, though one could also see connections to Mark Z. Danieleski's House of Leaves when taking into consideration the strange geometry present, though Shirley Jackson's work is most definitely the standout influence. And like Jackson's Haunting of Hill House, it imagines the concept of a haunted house in a chilling form, that of the house itself being the entity. But I'll talk more about Jackson's work in a bit. The game's themes do continue Kitty Horror Show's trend of personifying the environment, in this case, the house, after humans' interactions with it. Most closely, it reminds me of Actius, as we see the betrayed and hurt remnants of a place now left behind, and ends with said place taking revenge. When it comes to full, standalone games, that's the last of them on Kitty Horror Show's itch.io. Now, we are left to play through her compilations, the Haunted Cities collections. Altogether, these volumes contain more games than we've covered so far, so I'll try to get to the point with them. There all pretty unique and enjoyable experiences, and a few in here are actually really fleshed out projects. So let's jump right into volume one. So, what are the Haunted Cities collections? They're a collection of games and projects previously only released on Kitty Horror Show's Patreon, published in groups of four. We'll be starting with volume one, project one, Circadia. This one isn't a game, but it still feels very relevant. It's a short story read through these staticky images. We follow a woman who has the power to enter her CRT television and visit the worlds that lie in her VHS tape collection. A strange world that isn't quite our own, but a fuzzy, murky, and muted version of what appears on each tape. However, one of these tapes seems to be afflicting her collection with a curse. The tape shows the outside of a house, but as soon as it comes into view, the tape ejects itself. Trying to find her way to the house, she enters another tape and finds herself in a maze of millions of basements and hallways, very House of Leaves or Backrooms-esque. 
Eventually, she finds her way into the cursed tape through these passageways, and she's met with the outside of this house. And when she finally brings herself to enter, she's met with the visages of people inside, people that recognize her, and she breaks down. It seems to imply, somehow, that this house was her childhood home, and it's easy to infer that her fear of it and its ominous appearance is a reflection of some kind of trauma she sustained in her childhood home life or some kind of resentment of her past, her family. It's a gripping piece of flash fiction which I'd highly recommend reading for yourself. I don't think the brief spoilers I've provided here will ruin the experience. The actual writing on display is very captivating, and while it does continue personifying the environment as a villain like Anatomy or any number of her previous games, it also begins moving past just the theme of the forces of nature, but also onto this idea of the places we inhabit being a reflection of the trauma we experience there. No, what happened in her past likely wasn't the house literally being evil, but our experiences are so tied to the places we exist in that they can't help but become reflections of them. This theme will become more prominent later on as well. Grandmother. This project leans heavy in the retro lo-fi style, giving the vibes of early PC games and first-person dungeon crawlers. We find ourselves in a dark forest with a few different landmarks locations. I honestly got a little Slender the Eight Pages vibes from the map. Inside a dimly lit house, we can find an old woman sitting in front of a TV as calm music plays, staring blankly into static. You can also find a book inside, from which you can read various passages, such as, The man walked, driven like cattle by the tower's groans, and with each step he took, a new worm penetrated the sole of his foot, until he was not but a suit of skin for their family, teeming and boiling at the holes of his eyes. Yuck. You can also find a knife but where to use it? Not on grandma. As you explore, trying to find where to utilize your new implement, you can find a large, writhing mass of flesh and a barn that is giving me weird flashbacks. Entering the barn, all the sound cuts out, leaving you in a state of hair-raising shock. It's a really creepy moment in this atmospheric experience, but it gives me flashbacks to a really weird source, but I just need to share it. It took me back to the Barnyard PC game. A few years back, probably height of COVID 2020, I decided to mess around with old PC games and ended up downloading the Barnyard game from 2006. And the game played out pretty much normal, goofy music and side quests and animals walking around like humans. But then I entered the main barn and all the music cut out. The only animals in the barn were suddenly acting like regular animals, no talking to them, they're on all fours. It was startling. And then I go down to the basement of the barn and it's just as empty, except a single crate shaking like something is alive inside. Now this crate is just a reference to Wild Mike from the movie, which is probably scarier than anything I could have imagined was in that box. But why in the world they decided to make the barn specifically so creepy? I have no idea. Anyway, what were we talking about? You'll eventually stumble upon a series of bodies hung in gibbets, each one labeled with different so-called sin. You can choose to kill any of them, and doing so leads you to a red door where you can enter Terminus, which appears like a sort of hell, masses of flesh twisting in a cacophony of screams. The game ends with the text, I know which house is yours. So that's pleasant. This game is a good bit of spooky fun, but it isn't the last we'll see of Grandma. According to Jacob Geller's video, Four Short Games About Pain, this game is actually an attempt at recreating a nightmare Kitty Horror Show had, and we'll see another attempt at recreating that nightmare a few games down the line, so stay tuned for more spooky Grandma. Leech Bowl. This is a fun one. You find yourself in a black and white town at night. No one is around. You're alone in the dingy alleys and macabre street names like Hookworm Street and Hematoma Way. Posters and songs playing on radios inside various buildings give the impression of a 1940s, 50s era. But more than that, it paints an unsettling picture of a town obsessed with blood specifically drinking it. The town is covered in propaganda posters encouraging people to eat blood, gorge on it so that they can be fed to giant leeches. You can also grab bottles of blood and splatter them on the walls, which not only makes for a bit of fun, but can reveal more world-building messages. At the end of the game, you find yourself in a sort of factory just outside of town, surrounded by massive writhing leeches, and the message, gotta feed them leeches, baby girl. This game not only offers a great bit of spooky atmosphere, but also continues exploring Kitty Horror Show's interests in the forces of nature, exploring abandoned civilizations, and the disgusting world of writhing critters, all the while doing so in a really unique bit of Fallout-esque black-and-white stylization. Pente. This game takes a step back from the straight-up horror. 
You find yourself on a floating island that seems to have been turned into some sort of memorial. Reflective pools shimmer as massive swords pierce their surface. Stone tablets you find around the island reveal the story of an ancient being who lived here, protecting the world from the Black Star. But it wouldn't last forever. It started when the swords came down and pierced this deity, and the spirits that she bled became the reflective pools. And then these floating rocks we see around us appeared and either drove her away, or took her. After exploring this memorial, you move to enter the massive church and inside, nothing. It's empty. Going back outside, things have changed. The rocks replaced with islands and the last remaining altar reveals the text, it hurts so much, don't make me go. At first, this appears to be the end of the game, but if you jump from the island, you'll find yourself on a monochrome plane, massive pillars shooting from the ground. I don't know why, but I get the feeling this is where the deity was taken. Similar to Kitty's other works, we once again see the exploration of an ancient place and discover the details of its downfall with only enough answers to open more questions. Despite its short running time, I found this game to be one of the more emotionally impactful for me while playing it, and that brings us to the end of Volume 1. Gloom Puke, despite its rather icky name, is actually an incredibly cute little experience. It's similar to Grandmother in that it's very much an early PC game vibe, but aside from its grotesque naming conventions, it's actually just a cute bit of exploration. You find yourself in a strange world and get to explore it, meeting its inhabitants that seem just as confused as you are. They're not exactly sure how they got here, but have claimed areas to live and what their roles are. I definitely recommend playing it. It's not too long and has a lot of fun dialogue, and you still get that kitty horror show flair, in that it's about exploring and learning about a strange world, getting a little bit more context with each character you talk to. This one is actually pretty fleshed out. Continuing the retro PC game vibe, you find yourself trapped in a dark monastery. Outside you can hear wasps and hornets wreaking havoc. That's oddly familiar. The game plays out as a spooky, atmospheric puzzle game, exploring the various rooms and attempting to find all the keys to a specific door. Throughout this journey, you'll learn about the strange religion practiced here, centered around bugs and parasites. No surprise at this point in our expedition through Kitty Horror Show's games. Interestingly, in some of the religious texts we find, some of the passages read the same as the book found in Grandmother. In that same vein, the references to the hornets outside are only reinforced when we find a statue of Hate, Mother of the Hive, confirming its connection to the Hornets game. All of this suggests a vaguely connected universe between Kitty Horror Show's games, and Monastery won't be the last time we see these connections. Continuing to explore the courtyard in which we found the statue, we also find the graves of some of the members of this monastery, perhaps explaining its current emptiness. Digging them up, the bodies are all in various states of being transformed into bugs. All signs point to some sort of ritual gone wrong or perhaps worse, gone exactly according to plan. Collecting all the keys and moving into a new room, the sound of ancient singing fills the air. You can't help but feel you're getting closer to the belly of the beast. Through the next door, you're greeted with a forest very much similar to that of Grandmother, and the sound of a swarm growing ever louder. Reaching the end of the woods, you find a line of cloaked figures. Honor us. And so ends the game. While this game continues to explore the concept of ancient deities, bugs and parasites, religion, all of that, the thing I find most interesting is the world building it does, specifically by connecting previous works into each other. Let's see if that continues, shall we? Roads. Like I said, that love story aspect would come back around. Roads is a beautiful game, both in its prose and its visuals. You find yourself on the beaches of a few scattered islands, palm trees swaying and nothing but ocean waves on the horizon. It's dusk. Winding roads move up into the sky and back down, connecting the islands and interweaving with each other. Swords sprout from the ground like in Pente, and a few of the islands have towers and buildings on them. Glass bottles scattered throughout the environment begin painting massive text in the sky, just like some of our earlier games. The story, this time, tells of two women with strange powers who were exiled onto this island and slowly built these roads with said powers. We learn about them falling in love and eventually escaping the island, but leaving their story here for those who stumble upon it as they head into the unknown. It fits right in with the classic Kitty Horror Show gameplay, collecting remnants of a story explaining the world we find ourselves in, but does so in a decidedly less morbid way and again, the writing is great and it's a very peaceful, relaxing experience. Check it out. Scarlet Bow. Back to the creeps. We find ourselves arriving in an abandoned seaside town, centered around a massive tree. The main goal of the game seems to be collecting small coffins and breaking mirrors. Like many of Kitty Horror Show's games, it's an atmospheric adventure. And also like many of these games, we begin to learn a bit about the town's strange obsession slash religion through pages of a journal around town. Someone who attempted to investigate this place before. 
Interestingly, as this previous investigator explains the customs here, we also get references to other games like Leech Bowl. So again, we find ourselves in a sort of connected world between these games. And again, we find ourselves exploring the concepts of a villainous location as the tree starts revealing itself to be wickedly creeping its roots throughout the entire town. The ending I got included the sky going red and eventually being taken by the tree. Basements functions as a series of short vignettes. We start in a distorted, completely deranged hub world reminiscent of 0000, 000 FF000, and from here, we enter three different subworlds. One tells the story of a woman who's been stabbed as she wanders the street at night. She's disassociating, likening her experience to that of a pilot in a machine. She's unsure of what to do, bleeding out, and can muster nothing else but a scream. Another finds you in a series of halls and rooms ablaze with a raging fire. Fire. Text that appears on the walls paints a picture of a burning apartment complex. Some residents survive, others do not, but you are stuck in the basement. As the heat rises, smoke and soot fill the room and your lungs and your possessions and memories burn around you. You soon to join them. It's definitely one of the more visceral stories in Kitty Horror Show's library. The final story finds us in a cage floating through a dark forest, the floating head of an animal following us. The story is told through text that slowly pans out in front of us, presumably spoken from the animal. It describes its fate, killed but not eaten by its killer, instead being consumed by the earth, slowly dying as the worms and the bugs and the dirt assimilate it into the soil. And we, its killer, seem to be claimed by the dirt as well. We're in some sort of afterlife, met with our victim some trophy hunt that we had no reason to kill other than to claim it. But now we too are returned to the earth, consumed by the soil. There's some very clear underlying themes here about the horror of nature, the horror of decomposing, the earth claiming our bodies and grinding us to dust, and our equality under mortality we share with all animals despite our illusions of grandeur, similar to those themes explored in Dust City. Castle Wormclot. In the vein of Gloom Puke, despite Castle Wormclot's disgusting name, it's actually a very cute little experience. We are a wick lighter for this massive castle making the rounds to keep the castle well lit at night. Along the way we discover other residents of this castle and interesting little places that are scattered around the castle. It's a very cute little exploration game with a lot of personality in the dialogue. It's fun, check it out. Ghost Lake. This game is definitely more eerie, but I'd say it's just as calming as it is uncanny. We find ourselves in utter darkness driving through a small town at night. With smooth tunes flowing from your sick purple ride, you move from place to place finding bubbles that give you a sort of guided tour of the town from someone who used to live there. It portrays this dead-end town where everyone works at a factory that makes useless things, never exported anywhere, just working because there's nothing else to do. The one time the town tried anything, building a tunnel out of town, it became so difficult that everyone just threw in the towel, escaped to their homes where the doors scabbed over. It's empty not because it's abandoned, but because the people are insulated. On the outskirts of town, we can see the silhouette of a massive skeleton, but there's not much in the way of explanation. Our tour guide clearly despised this town, a suffocating, lonely place where dreams go to die. When everyone was boarded up, they buried themselves in the snow at their favorite spot. Our own chance at escape doesn't seem too good. All the freeway signs read messages like, give up, stay, or leave us alone. It's an extreme version of small, dead-end towns where everyone is just waiting to die. Its themes remind me most closely to that of Circadia, the story about the woman who could explore the tapes in her CRT, the way the house reflected her experience in childhood. In Ghost Lake, the town, from the scabbed over doors to the hopeless messages on the signs, reflects the inhabitants' hopelessness. Or maybe it's the other way around. The town these people were born in, so isolated and lacking in opportunity, the residents simply reflect the unfortunate circumstances of their environment. Seven Days. In my opinion, this is one of Kitty Horror Show's best. Everything from the writing, visuals, and various quirks of the game make it a unique and gripping piece of fiction. The first little quirk of the game is that it truly is a seven day experience. Depending on the date on your computer, you get a slightly different piece of the story and environment for every day of the week. There's no real climax or ending, it's just seven days in the life of someone in a world that is odd, dystopian, but frighteningly close to reality. Each day we explore the same house with slightly different furnishings, layouts, and exterior worlds every day, reflecting in some way the story that plays out. Each day has a series of journal entries to find which spell out the main plot. The world in this story is, in typical kitty horror show fashion, quite grim filled with viscera and bugs and goop, but it is able to keep itself grounded in the writings of what seem to be a very relatable, average person. 
It combines the strange and the familiar to craft a compelling world. The dystopia filled with both the very real issues of toxic air and natural disasters and the incoming effects of climate change, and combines that with sweeping murder robots, strange anomalies, and massive living bug trains. Combining the real interactions of our world, the day-to-day -day of grocery shopping, being bugged by annoying friends to go out, picking up hormones, being yelled at by some stranger on a walk, and mixing them with the fantastically macabre elements like cybernetic workers and strange creatures that feed on blood. I found the character in this world endlessly relatable, and I wanted to see them live a better life, but then again, maybe this is the best type of life you can live in this world. They find themselves in a difficult environment, sure, but they can afford to eat, their house has been spared by the various disasters that left others homeless or worse. What it did most effectively was paint both a fantastically and brutally real picture of a world ravaged by the effects of natural disasters and the hostile forces of nature. It was powerful to me because it gives a window into a parallel world that may not be too different from ours in the coming decades, as climate change's effects continue. Interestingly though, unlike many of the previous games that paint the house as a sort of villain, the house we find here feels like it's shown in a better light. Not quite a haven, but a place of stability as the world outside becomes more and more fucked up. And that's how I feel about my house sometimes too, though that could be due to my crippling social anxiety. Also, the floating guys scared the fuck out of me. And so we come to our last four games. Let's see what Kitty Horror Show has in store for our finale. Exclusion Zone. Back to our explorative roots, we play as an archaeological researcher sent to gather data at a mysterious religious site, now filled with deadly radiation after some kind of disaster that left everything surrounding it in ruin, all originating from the massive tower in the center. As we explore, we get to see pieces of previous reports by other researchers shedding more light on the area. The reports all seem baffled, unable to understand this place's purpose and how it connects to the other religious sites of the civilization. Compared to all other recorded religious sites that have been uncovered this one just doesn't seem to match the rest. But some light begins to shed when at the center of the tower we find a report from a researcher who came to a sudden realization. Not one of science and observation, but an emotional realization, as if bestowed upon him some sort of supernatural empathy. This disaster was the result of a god out of place, a deity cast away by her sisters to this unfamiliar place where its inhabitants don't know how to worship or care for her. They have their own customs and religion, and this strange temple seems to be the culmination of their attempts to understand this goddess's needs. But despite their best efforts, it just doesn't fit. Their language is not hers, she's alone and confused, and in the end, her scream for help of sorrow causes the disaster. It's another very powerful exploration of some of Kitty Horror Show's favorite concepts, the forces of nature, nuclear disaster, the pain of incompatible relationships, and betrayal. Grandmother's Garden. Told you grandma would be back. This time, things are a bit different. Now, in a style more similar to Resident Evil and other classic survival horror games, you once again find yourself in a dark forest, with a dingy house containing a glassy-eyed old woman watching the static of a blank TV. But this time, the plot is spelled out for us just a bit more. Our protagonist has been raised by her grandmother to feed this forest, an ecosystem of parasitic, flesh-eating, supernatural branches and mycelium and veins. You explore this environment's horrific nature, a well that secretes fluid and bile, a tree fed on the bodies of sinners that your grandmother forced you to help bury, even as a small child. Your grandmother, too weak and old to do much of anything herself anymore, commands you to get digging in her garden. And as you do, the character begins to feel that something is off. This all culminates in the garden opening beneath her and dragging her down, feeding. It's probably one of the only jump scares present in Kitty Horror Show's game so far. The game not only does a good job of personifying this horrific forest as an almost deity-like force, but I think more horrific than that is the relationship between the protagonist and her grandmother. Her grandmother forcing her to participate in this cruel, sacrificial worship, giving her life away to feed its rotten roots. While the relationship between the forest and the family could be seen as parasitic, more than that, the way the grandmother feeds off of and relies on her granddaughter in this abusive relationship is more horrific than any flesh tree. Lethargy Hill. We are once again entering the world of the retro PC game look. Lethargy Hill has you wander the grounds outside a house on a hill as it tells you the story of the woman who lives there, though she and the world she inhabits is not like our own. In typical Kitty Horror Show fashion, it's a bloody, goopy, fleshy mess. The story follows this woman who lives all alone, so she decides to build a family out of her own blood and the corpses of the animals around her. A jealous sister, a wandering husband, a perfect son, and a daughter to keep her sister company. How 
However, she quickly finds that this family does not fill the hole she is feeling. Her creations either bore her or do things she had not intended. The only one she truly likes, her son, ends up being too fragile and breaks apart, so she destroys them all and is alone again. And now she lies in wait for a visitor, you, to tear their skin off and finally she will no longer be alone. The world becomes more and more distorted as you play, all the while the silhouette of the house looms over us and near the end the text reads almost like it's from this woman herself. It's a story of unfulfillment, of unhappiness with your work, but also with the things that you worked for, that you thought would fill the voids you had, but in the end only left you with destruction and the same hole you craved to cover. Tenement. And here we are, our final game. What does Tenement have in store? The game has you explore a small skitty a skittyscape, a gritty scape, more like- <laughs> The game has you explore a small cityscape floating in a void. Apartment complexes, movie theaters, scattered around this tenement are its bizarre residents. Characters who are similar in style to those in Gloom Puke or Worm Clot, but a little bit spookier. They talk to you about various things, mostly the things they're frustrated by. How much they hated having a body, bureaucracy, but mostly they talk about places strange places. Hotels that birth new rooms that could kill you, but if you find the right one, you can kill the hotel. Houses that die with its inhabitants leaving a massive hole in the ground. A house that melds with you and your skin and holds you in its mouth. Buildings full of endless halls. Terrariums of human skin. Ghosts. Each of these characters seems frustrated by their various afflictions or pet peeves, but none particularly perturbed or scared by the unsettling nature of their world. It's simply the reality they live in. And that's an element that extends through much of Kitty Horror Show's writing, a casual matter-of-factness about the strange worlds the characters inhabit. At any time, you can restart the world by pressing F5, leading to a slightly different state and new things for the NPCs to say. However, if you restart the game too many times, it starts breaking down and the people begin to hurt, pleading with you to stop. If you restart a final time, the game imprisons you, with text scrawled on the walls. You used us up. We are angry. Come back tomorrow. And it's true, booting the game up again will find you still trapped, and you have to actually wait until the next day for the game to function again. I find the game to be a wonderful intersection of so many previous elements we've explored here, so it's a fitting finale. The meta elements of the game and world in pain as you interact with it, the strange personified hostile environments, and the characters in their strange relationships and worlds. Despite the through lines in Kitty Horror Show's work, there's a lot of variety, and we could explore any number of recurring threads that wind through these games. Like I said in the beginning though, I'd like to focus in on her use of environments. Because throughout these projects, with rare exception, there aren't really any traditional enemies. No pale figure chasing you through a forest, no zombie ambling through abandoned cities, no demon-possessed child. And yet these games still build fear and tension and dread, a sense of danger. Where does it come from? It comes from the environment, the places we explore, their sights and sounds, and much of the time the context we slowly begin to learn through their stories. Like the house in anatomy slowly building a picture of danger in the walls you stand among. There's a few different ways this is explored in these games, and I'd like to discuss them as they relate to these games, along with discussing some other pieces of media that explore them similarly, and how they may relate. To start, let's talk about a different kind of haunted house. So what do I mean by a different kind of haunted house? Well, in the typical understanding, the haunted element of a house comes from some entity within the house, a spirit who died there, a demon. And they're the ones, for instance, slamming doors or moving furniture. There's another way a haunted house can be explored, however, where the house itself, not an outside entity, is the source. The location itself, the walls and floorboards and ceiling, are alive versus another entity in the house. Anatomy does this very clearly, describing the house as being alive. In a literal sense, we could compare this to Monster House, in which the house literally does have anatomy as described, including razor teeth and windows for eyes. While it is technically haunted by a spirit, that spirit manifests itself not as an apparition but as the beams and boards of the house itself. But the more direct inspiration for anatomy comes from a source that does away with the spirit almost entirely. Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House does not really feature the spirits of any of those who died within the home's walls. Instead, it seems to describe the house itself as simply off, wrong. All its angles are off by a fraction of a centimeter, its layout confusing and easy to get lost in. Its tricks are subtle at first, doors closing and opening on their own, disorienting anyone who walks inside it. And the source of its corrupt nature does not seem to have come from any particular tragedy, but was simply there from its construction. It was just built 
wrong. You also see this in something like The Shining, with the Overlook Hotel being a malicious force in itself. Anatomy isn't alone in this theme, though, when it comes to kiddie horror shows games. Kryza is similar, these monuments sprouting like massive obsidian flora seeming to send messages to the villagers' minds. These buildings are alive. Aside from maybe the eye near the end, there's no spirit here. The monuments themselves are dangerous on their own. They are massive, intimidating, and threatening, and this element of their immense size helps hammer home their danger. Search megalophobia and you're met with images of massive cruise ships or trees or statues or skyscrapers. Even if you don't happen to have that phobia, there's something about seeing something so much bigger than us that can inspire awe and fear, make us understand how small we really are, which is something Kitty Horror Show also explores more deeply in projects like Dust City, but we'll get back to that. Speaking of Dust City though, House Nightmare and Tenement include elements of this as well, with descriptions of houses that consume you. Zero, 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 F, F, you know what, I'm just gonna call it zero F. Zero F explores this through the architecture of the code itself, a living game that's geometry is contorted and hostile to you which we also see a bit of in anatomy. With the disruption of the laws of physics with impossible architecture, I can't help but be reminded of House of Leaves, a story in which a family moves into a house which is slightly bigger on the inside than out, and things ramp up when a doorway appears that leads into an impossibly long hallway, branching out into massive, dark, changing paths. Being inside the dark maze, it becomes clear that the environment is inhospitable and dangerous, possibly even alive and antagonistic to those inside. A hallway could be 10 yards down and 10 miles coming back, and those inside sometimes hear a loud growl or roar. It is speculated throughout the story that there's some beast inside this maze, but if there is, we never see it, and it's never really the cause of any of the danger. The danger is the shifting walls of the house itself. And in the later half of the book, it's made pretty clear just how violent the house can be. House of Leaves also shares another interesting similarity with Zero F though. The strange shifting geometry of the house isn't just used in the story, but on the pages of the book itself. Words spiral and twist, shrink and change formatting, drawing your eye around like the text itself is a maze. You actually can find yourself getting lost when reading the book or disoriented just like the characters in the house. In the same way, Zero F starts with you navigating through folders and files, getting lost in the walls of your computer. And this element of the game itself being alive builds on the strange way that both House of Leaves and Zero F utilize unique methods of reaching through the story itself out into the real world making the way you experience the game on a meta level parallel with the story. A game like Grandmother's Garden also explores the concept of an environment itself being alive and antagonistic, but in a slightly different way. In reality, a forest does kind of work like a massive organism, connected through its roots and fungal networks. While I think a game like Grandmother's Garden can function on this new kind of haunted house level, I think it more so begins expanding on Kitty Horror Show's exploration of a hostile environment through the lens of the forces of nature. In Kitty Horror Show's work, the concept of the forces of nature are more often than not interpreted through the lens of deities standing in for the elements in and of themselves, oftentimes as a way to explore repercussions of our own effects on nature, for instance with Actius' exploitation or an exclusion zone where a civilization's inability to properly care for a deity leads to a radioactive disaster. On that note, the element of nuclear radiation also comes up in Kryza with its irradiated pyramid, and I think it makes sense why. Nuclear radiation is a perfectly terrifying element of our world that still feels almost supernatural an invisible force of immense power and danger. And it works really well as an impending threat and sense of doom in a world without a direct monster. That technique of building dread and danger without a monster is exactly why Kitty Horror Show's projects feel so unique, and why the themes of natural forces work so well for this. In our real lives, we are sometimes in danger because of fellow humans, but often we are placed in peril not from anything with a motive. It is simply the environment around us and its uncaring nature. Weather events like tornadoes or fires or ocean waves, building collapses, gas leaks, these are not entities out to get us, they are simply the world in which we live. Even things less dynamic than a tornado or the ocean, places that for the most part remain perfectly still, can put us in mortal danger. Barren desert landscapes, massive cliffs, caves. I recently found myself in the depths of a cave for a video I'm currently still editing, and I can tell you firsthand, despite not even going very far in, 
The darkness and maze-like labyrinth of a cave can be pretty terrifying, but what might be even scarier is the little voice in your head that tells you to just keep going. The one that doesn't want you to turn back, that wants to see what's around the next bend until you can't go any further. Anyway, look forward to Anorak Season 2! This element is also explored through more dynamic and living parts of nature, like the bugs in Hornets or Monastery or Leech Bowl, and through the flora of Grandmother's Garden or Scarlet Bow. There's a sense of nature's superiority over humans, or more so, a reminder of our place in nature. We are not above it, we are but another part of the food chain, which is explored really well in one of the basement vignettes or the end of the world in Dust City. This theme is also explored in the film Vivarium, which also focuses on parasitic relationships, another theme Kitty Horror Show is fond of. A couple becomes trapped in a massive cookie cutter suburb and is forced to care for the young of a strange species which mimics human beings in order to be raised, very explicitly in reference to the cuckoo bird, who lay their eggs in other birds' nests, often outcompeting the mother bird's actual chicks and being the only survivor. I'll be bringing up the film again in a minute, but the way it places humans in a relationship we typically understand as belonging to the other of nature, less intelligent animals, it reminds me a lot of how Kitty Horror Show's games push us into places where we are forced to reckon with our place in nature, not outside of it. On the note of minimizing ourselves in the face of much bigger forces, we often see ourselves in places that are ancient, deities that are immortal, or civilizations long since past. Seeing this, it sort of temporally shrinks us, makes us aware of how small we are, how vulnerable, how mortal we are. And we find this fascination with the age of these places in other media too. For instance, in House of Leaves, we have the lost colonists who may have found the house at the center of the story hundreds of years before our characters. There's something about how the world around us was here so long before us and will be here so long after that makes us confront our mortality. Whether that be like in Dust City where the world ends all at once, turning everything we know to sand, or slower like in Seven Days, where weather events cause our ability to live normal lives to get more and more difficult. So the last big aspect I want to discuss here is how each of these worlds we've explored reflect those who inhabit them. I do have one last little thing I'll talk about after, but let's start here first. The thing about the places we inhabit is that they aren't static. Despite the power I've emphasized these places have, they are not immune to influence. There's a sort of two-way street as our environments influence us, and we influence our environments. In a very direct sense, we see this explored in Kitty Horror Show's games like Ghost Lake, where we see the town smothering its inhabitants, sucking the motivation out of them until they cocoon themselves inside their homes. The residents giving up due to their suffocating environment. Exclusion Zone is similar, as the strange religious site we explore is created as a result of a god out of place, or in Grandmother's Garden, where the trees of flesh feed on the dead which we've buried. But in a less direct way, often in these games we find the places serve as reflections of those who live there, symbolically or physically manifesting itself. We see this in Circadia, where the woman's childhood home becomes an ominous figure in her tape collection, or very explicitly in Rain House Eternity, where the world you explore is literally the body of the person from which you are hearing the story, each step and doorway a chosen form. In Lethargy Hill, we also see how the woman in the house on the hill attempts to shape her world, telling a story of unfulfillment in her family, which brings us back to Vivarium, which also deals with a similar theme. Aside from its direct comparison to the cuckoo bird, the film utilizes the endless cookie-cutter suburb and strange reinforcement of the traditional family through the environment to slowly push the characters into their roles as parents, irrespective of whether they actually want to be in this situation. In combination with its parasitic themes, its world creates a perfect commentary on how draining and unfulfilling raising a child can be if you are unprepared or unwilling, and how culture pushes us into roles we don't always fit into. A theme we also see in Rain House Eternity. House of Leaves shows reflections of the characters in their environment too, as the allure or fear of the dark maze draws out unique conflicts within the characters. On the topic of House of Leaves, MyHouse.Wad, an incredible Doom 2 mod partially inspired by House of Leaves, similarly reflects the story of the two characters within the story, as we find more about the two creators of the map in the mind-bending worlds. Like in Kitty Horror Show's works, we find the events and personalities of the people in these places directly reflecting the state of the places themselves, from the pathways and roads to the massive skeleton in the outskirts of the dead town on Ghost Lake. 
The last thing I wanted to mention in this analysis is just how interesting I find this approach to horror, utilizing the environment and the environment alone to build fear. From the sound to the look of the world, I think understanding the location as a valid character in horror and its relationship to your character can open up new and interesting ways to experiment with horror storytelling. From a meta sense like the pages of House of Leaves or the files of Zero F, to the teeth and broken geometry of anatomy, to the spinal steps of Rain House Eternity, I think it would be really interesting to see more up-and-coming horror creators try their hand at this sort of thing. And if you're looking for more of this kind of thing, I'd suggest all the other media I've referenced here, as well as some of the others I didn't get to expand on here, Skinamarink, A Visit by Shirley Jackson, Kane Pixel's new project, The Oldest View, Anthology of the Killer by The Catamites does a bit of this, for instance, with The Hands of the Killer. Anyway, check all those out. So that was my look into Kitty Horror Show's games. As I said, I think if any of these caught your eye, you should download it and try it for yourself. They're really great to experience for yourself. Apologies for the longer than normal wait on this video, I was in the process of moving again, but I've finally been able to settle in and I'm excited for the next video, which will hopefully be ready in time for Halloween. And a little further in the future, I've got the new Anorak video coming out that I'm excited about, and if you're into more of this sort of stuff, I have a House of Leaves video planned for sometime in the future. That's a big undertaking though. Anyway, thank you all for watching, see you all next time.